Welcome to a supplement video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. Now I'm calling this a supplement video because it's just a little bit extra to add on to the last video we did, which is part 6B of the aerodynamic design of the UWS-4 Ultralight Airplane. And in that video and part 6A, we were talking about the geometry of the tail of the airplane. Now I left a few things out of part 6B that I felt were necessarily required and adding them in would make the video too long. Now, after posting that video, I thought, you know, I don't really like leaving that stuff out. Let's just add a short little video and add that stuff back in. So that's what we have here. If you haven't seen part 6A or 6B, go back and take a look at those. I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner to part 6A. Let's talk a little bit more about that supplemental information. I wasn't too happy with some of the configuration of that tail. In particular, I had added a few little vertical pieces to the tail to help attach it to the twin booms. And here in a moment, we'll have some pictures to look at, but I'll go ahead and just talk about it first. So in order to make those little vertical pieces shorter, I wanted to increase the angle of the dihedral from 35 degrees that we had to 40 degrees. And then I decided to move those little attachment points out just a little bit farther. So that helps reduce that vertical section, but it also helped give me a longer angle of section, which let me have a longer control surface span, which gives me a little bit more control authority. So I really like that. And then something I forgot to mention in the last video, that little center section at the top is an excellent place to put pitch trim instead of out on the control surfaces. Now let's finally take a look at some pictures. So here's the before and after. So here's what we had for the tail in part 6B. And so the vertical spots I'm talking about are these vertical spots here. So we had our angled surfaces at 35 degrees from horizontal. And I don't want to go out farther than this area because I want to have the outer wing panels be removable so I can put this all assembled into a trailer. So I can't go out past this for the tail. But I have a little bit of room. I can actually come out just a little bit more at least out to where the edge of this boom is. So over here, I've now increased the angle to 40 degrees and I'm bringing it out just a little bit farther. So that makes this angled section longer, it gives me more control surface span, which should give me a little more control authority. And then for that trim tab area, up in this area at the back, I'll put a trim tab. That makes it much easier than having to put a trim tab on each one of these control surfaces for pitch control. So I'm liking this a whole lot better. And you can probably see, I actually lowered this down just a little bit too. You can see there's a little space here and that space is pretty much gone here, but I think that won't be a problem. I think it'll still be out of the major wake from the propeller. So here we'll talk about why I don't think lowering it down just a little bit more is gonna be a problem. You may remember back, I don't know how long ago it's been, we we're talking about air pressure. And air that's moving faster has lower pressure. Well, that's what you're going to have coming out behind the prop. The air behind the prop is going to be moving faster, so it has lower pressure. Well, the pressure outside that area is going to be higher. Well, when you get a higher pressure here and lower pressure here, it's going to squeeze it in a little bit. And that's what you see from these green lines here. The air as it's approaching the prop starts getting a little bit lower pressure and lower and going faster, and so it's gonna squeeze in a little bit. Now you can see from this dotted line, this is almost straight back, and so you can see that this prop wake should compress a little bit and be a little bit farther away from this tail. So that's why I think the tail will still be outside the wake of the prop, and so we won't get a lot of extra drag from this wake. Now, this air here is going a little bit faster, but not as fast as this air here. And so as you come out farther away, the air gets slower and slower until you get to the ambient air. So there will be just a little bit faster air going over this tail and around this tail than if it was farther away. But I think the bulk of that air, especially down in this area, we're avoiding, so I think we're in pretty good shape. There's another factor that will help us out too. There's gonna to be a downward wake coming off the trailing edge of this wing that will also bring this airstream it down a little bit lower. It may only be about six inches or so. That will also help get our propeller wake underneath our tail. Now this brings up another factor. The air that's going through 
and underneath this tail is going to be a little bit faster than the air going around the outside of the tail. So we've got a pressure difference. We've got higher pressure here, lower pressure down here. What's that going to do? It's going to push down on our tail and it's going to give us a pitch up tendency. I don't think it's going to be much, but there will be a little bit of that there. That's just kind of a knowledge point. If we get some odd pitch up tendencies when we're doing our flight testing, we're going to have to do some investigation in this area to see if we're getting too much pitch up tendency here. Now, if we are, what we may end up having to do is raise this motor up just a little bit so we get a little bit of a thrust line above our center of gravity. Or we'll have to raise the tail up a little farther and get it farther away from the prop wash. But it's just something we need to keep in mind when we get to flight testing. I have another book of Dan's called Aircraft Design, A Conceptual Approach. And something that he said in the Simplified Aircraft Design book caught my attention. I wanted to come back to his more detailed book, this Aircraft Design, A Conceptual Approach book, and see if he had any more to say about it. And he referenced an interesting NAC report in there, Report 826. And if you're interested in details, you might want to take a look at this report. Now, it was done a long, long time ago. But even still, it has some very interesting information in it. Now, a lot of it we've already talked about before. There's a couple little pieces I wanted to pull out, things I knew but didn't really talk about in Part 6B. And this first one is a V-tail, depending on whether it's upright or upside down, will it increase or decrease the airplane's overall dihedral effect? Now, if you have an upright, a normal V-shape, you're going to be increasing the overall airplane's dihedral effect. And that kind of makes sense. Now, if you have it inverted, like I'm going to do on this airplane, you're actually going to be decreasing the overall dihedral effect. Now, it's not a huge amount, but that effect is there, and so we have to keep an eye on that also. If we have to, we may have to increase the dihedral on our wings just a little bit more. And then here's another thing that is a really good advantage of the inverted V-tail, and the V-tails also. When you deploy the flaps on the wing, the V-tail is almost always significantly above the downwash of that wing. And so the pitch trim of the airplane won't change or won't change much when you deploy flaps. Now, if you have an airplane like the old Cessna 152 or even most of the high wing Cessnas, when you go and deploy flaps, you have a significant change and the airflow over the horizontal tail, and it makes a significant change in the pitch trim of the airplane. But with the V-tail, a significant part of that tail is going to be above the downwash of the wing when you have the flaps deployed. So you don't have to worry about pushing forward on that stick when you go and deploy your flaps. So that's something that's really nice. Well, that's the end of this video. Nice, short, and sweet video. But I think it has some very interesting points about V-tails and inverted V-tails that I thought you might like to know that I found interesting but didn't add to the other video. Well, guys, until next time.